Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. Well, we're going to finish up on defining the Christian. And we'll get back into some things at another time. And we'll take some other angles to the whole idea of defining a Christian. By no means, you've heard me say, do I think that I have a corner in this area? No, no, no. I thank God that I'm just sharing some things that are very real to me about a Christian. So, number one, we do these videos for you to experience God in a more tangible and real way. Number two, the more real God is, the more you'll find yourself uh, enjoying your faith adventure instead of working so hard to try to get it. Number three, when you have testimonies, it's the funnest thing in the world to share. So we're going to give you our passage in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 to 30 in the Message Bible. And it says this, now Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son like the father does, nor the father like the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Well, what a joy it's been to be in Newtown, uh, Connecticut, at Grace Family Church with the Fredericks. Praise the Lord. Pastor Adam's doing a wonderful job. And then, of course, the founders, Pastor Barry and Sheila Fredericks, are just such dear friends of ours. And all the staff <clears throat> and family, and it's really, really awesome. We have just a let your hair down, just be yourself time there. But we did just get back, and we've only got about 13 hours, and we are back on the road again. Amen. Back on the road again. And I feel like I need to say sorry that I'm in this shirt. I have slept in it every night. I've not washed it. No, I'm just kidding. I have it, but it kind of makes me feel like you, you might think that. But hey, the What's Next pop-up book is, is coming soon. I've got the typeset copy one more time through, we get the final, and then it goes to print. So next week, I will have it going to print, and uh, it'll probably just be maybe a week to 10 days before I have those books. We will make sure and have an ebook, and then in December, I will do some audio and make sure that it turns into an audio book. So it's going to be real fun. I know you're going to enjoy it. Well, Let's jump back into where we were, and I know I'm going to read it again. Maybe you're tired, but please don't get tired of this. It's such, such good material. John 17, 20 to 27 in the Riggs translation, and here we are talking about defining a Christian, and really, we're showing that a Christian is just like God, just like Jesus, and Jesus, of course, was able to say to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And we should be able to say to someone else, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. So that kind of brings up a real interesting question, which is what kind of Jesus are you showing people? Are you showing Jesus at all? And if you are, what kind? You know, I hope you're not showing uh, people uh, a kind of Jesus that's very anxious that's just so inundated in trying to study and get faith because he's not sure that he's going to get a miracle or not, and he's trying to work himself into God's favor, because that actually, what, that, what, well, that wasn't Jesus. Hopefully, you're showing uh, the kind of Jesus that's actually very cool and very relaxed and very peaceful, and he just continues to fellowship with his Father and out of that, he just responds in faith to what he sees the Father show him, what he hears the Father tell him. And he walks in that place where he continually progresses in his ability to hear and see and know of spiritual things, which always conquer like scissor, uh, paper, rock. Sorry, I had to actually put my mind on that for a second to get it. Here we are in Riggs' translation. Notice what he says. 
It's the prayer of Jesus to the Father. Such is my prayer for these beloved disciples, but my heart's desire reaches out beyond them to all believers in all times and places who shall, shall by means of, of their preaching come to faith in me. So he's talking about us in our generation. May they all, O Father, who accept me as their Savior, uh, let nothing imperil the unity. May they all be one. So what's he talking about in this oneness? Well, then he goes on to say, as you are in me and I am in you, one in spirit and life. He wants us to be so aware that we are actually in him and he is actually in us, one in spirit and life. There's a unity there. There's a consciousness there. That was the word John Lake used, the consciousness of Christ. In other words, so real is God, there is a knowing and a, if you will, an interaction and involvement with Jesus because he's very, very real. This is exactly what a Christian gets to experience. Now, who got to experience that in the Old Covenant? Well, even some of the people that God called didn't have always that experience. I'd say Moses was the closest in the way that he walked with God and would go to the tent of meeting and God's glory would come down like a mist and God would speak to him out of that. And then even Moses didn't challenge, but he greatly desired, uh, God, show me your glory. And then God didn't say, well, you can't actually see that. He just said, you can't see my face, but I'll put you in the cleft of a rock. And when I pass by, I'll put my hand over you. So nothing happens to you, but you'll be able to see me as I walk by. That's pretty cool. Amen. Moses had some really awesome experiences with God. But you know, uh, Paul said, inspired by the Holy Ghost, that what, Paul, what Moses experienced in his dispensation is actually like nothing compared to what we can experience in this dispensation. As hard as that is conceptualized, because remember, we've been sold a bill of goods through religion that God doesn't visit people anymore that God is not real. Don't be looking for voices or you'll get the devil's voice. It's not interesting. We seem to have a greater sense of appreciation in a negative connotation towards the devil actually speaking and the devil actually doing things than we do Jesus. Now, how in the world can that defeated angel have a greater sense of consciousness, respect, even if you say, well, I don't respect him. Well, in a sense, you do because you give him greater tangibility than you do Jesus, and you're afraid of him more than you're actually excited about the Lord. So somehow we've switched this thing around, religion has, so that we remove God and we just feel like God doesn't really help us. We have to please plead, you know, for God to do it. But boy, if you even look in the direction of the devil, <laughs> There he is, ready to accommodate you at the moment's notice. Now, I am sorry, but that is 100% incorrect. And if you would say to me, well, I don't mean to be sarcastic, but that's what I've experienced in life. You can't go by your experience. The experience is distorted. It's perverted. It's because of the way religion has presented God that has made God seem like he's so far away. We need to re-present him and represent him as the God who is close as the mention of his name. He lives within our hearts. The devil can't get that close. Jesus is so much closer and greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And God's love is greater than the devil's hatreds. And God's manifestation and power of the Holy Ghost is so much more thorough than the demonic spirits who'd like to take you down every night and, 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 and beat your brains in until you surrender. We've got to get a new perspective on our Lord and Savior. And you're going to have to contend for this because you can't find it too often in what you call the local churches. You'll find information about him, but not much manifestation. So as we go, Jesus is saying, let nothing imperil this kind of unity of those who accept me as their Savior. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, one in spirit and life, may they be one in us in order that by such a spiritual unity the world may be compelled to believe in the divine origin of my mission. Well, what part of the world right now 
is beating the door down, compelled to say, hey, I want more of that gospel message. We must have to produce something so startling and real to the world with consistency to change the paradigm until <clears throat> even the world begins to believe. And may I say, even the church begins to believe. The rest of this is so awesome. It says, I have given them what you gave me. What did God give Jesus? <laughs> While he was in a human body, God gave Jesus the glory of revealing the divine in that human body. Like on the Mount of Transfiguration, <laughs> glory and majesty and lightning coming out of him. Like walking through the town and everybody's touching him and there's glory and vibrations coming in and out of Jesus and the woman with the issue of blood touches and <laughs> Jesus feels this power go out of him and he has to turn around to say, who touched me? Like being out there in the meadow, just like I'm looking at right now, and he's talking to a thousand people, oh, maybe 10,000 people, and the sound of the hill just carried, and they all heard his voice, which is the craziest thing because we have to be really careful. I got a loud voice, you know, and, and we're here, and everybody here seems to have, a, you know, quite a few acres, so we're, we're away from each other, but oh my goodness, in this valley, you can just hardly whisper and you can hear everybody. You gotta be real careful when you're outside. Maybe that's how it was with Jesus. The sound just traveled. They heard him. Not only did he preach to them, but then he took a little lunch and he gave them lunch and they couldn't even eat it all. And there were 12 baskets left over. Probably some 30,000 people ate. Is that not the most amazing thing? And this is like the regular for Jesus. And this is what Jesus said the Father gave him. And now he gave that to us. Oh, can you see it? The glory of revealing the divine in human life. And then he goes on to say, of describing it, of knowing and showing forth the Father's love. Or of experiencing and then showing what you experienced of the Father's love in order that they, as we, may live in and for each other, I in them and you in me. He's got to repeat that statement because that's the one thing he wants you to get. And that one thing seems to be the thing that produces results. Jesus said over in John 10, earlier, in the 30th verse, I and my father are one. Verse 31, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Verse 32, for what good work do you stone me? The Jews said in retaliation, not for a good work, but you being a man, make yourself God. Look at what they got all upset about is Jesus was claiming this unity with the father. Now, if they got upset, that means the devil is saying, stop them, stop them. Don't let that out. Don't let him tell that. Don't let him demonstrate that. Stop him. Stone him. Why does he want to stop it? Is he afraid maybe there's power to produce results, to captivate the world, bring the world into an understanding of what Jesus has done and cause the world to lift their hands and accept Christ as Savior? The devil's giving it away. He's giving us a gift by showing us through the hatred of the Pharisees, the very one thing that took him to the cross. It wasn't the miracles. It was what caused the miracles to work. Come on, if somebody's got some miracles, you can say, well, he's special. We've done that in, in the circles of, of charism, charismatic, uh, word of faith, um, prophetic camps, we've done that. Well, they got a special anointing on them, which then discredits the rest of us. So don't think you could do it, but I mean, they can, which is good for their ministry because then you'll follow them all around the world trying to get something from them that you know you can't get from anybody else. But notice Jesus is really hammering this unity. I and you and you and me and we are all in the Father. And then he ends with this, the result will be. Okay, what's the result? That the world shall come to know. The world shall come to experience. 
through evidence which cannot be denied that my mission is from you and that the church is the church of God. Notice what he says. He says, this is the result of what happens when you know that I am in you and you are in me and we are in the Father. All right, I'm gonna turn to another passage of scripture because like this isn't the only time he's ever said anything about this, you guys. I mean, this is something that Jesus actually talks about. When he was talking to his disciples and giving them some of the most wonderful uh, scriptures and knowledge and doctrine about us being able to do the works just like he does the works. And I'm going to the Father. And if you'll go ahead and pray to the Father in my name, you know, we'll do anything we have to do. Even if we have to go make it, we'll make sure that you have it. Uh, powerful thoughts. And here in the 18th to the 20th verse, he's mentioning to them things about his departure. And he says, I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. Well, what do you mean you're coming back? Where are you going? Well, where he's going is into the heart of the earth, into hell itself, to redeem mankind. He's going to come out of hell. Then he's going to go back into the heart of the earth where all the Old Testament saints are being held. And he's going to preach the gospel to them and they will receive him, and then he will take them out of that holding place where they can go on up into heaven because he is the redeemed of the Lord. And here he says to his disciples, I won't leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a little while, the world will no longer see me. See, that's when he's gone. He's laid in the grave. But you're going to see me because I am alive. See, he's telling them, while I'm in the grave, the world's not gonna see me, but I'm coming back alive. And then you're going to see me. And when he says that, he says, you're about to come alive. Now, what is the you're about to come alive statement? But when they believe on him spiritually, they're going to be reborn and they will come alive of the spirit. And in the moment they come alive. Oh, that's what it says. At that moment, not 10 years from now, not if you diligently study Although study and diligence are a great thing. But in the moment that you accept him as Savior and your spirit comes alive, he goes on to say, you will know absolutely. In other words, you will experience with absoluteness. What am I going to experience so absolutely? What am I going to experience that's going to literally alter the way I see myself? He goes on to say that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Do you see it again? He's hammering on these thoughts here. Why? Because this is so important. It is the great mystery of the church, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Jesus showing us that Christ is in you and you are in Christ. And together, we are really in the heart of the Father. We are DNA of his DNA, flesh of his flesh, spirit of his spirit, mind of his mind. Glory to God. We still have our individuality, but we are filled with God's presence. That's a Christian. And that man or woman will do something for Jesus. I remember Brother Hagin saying, no one has ever done anything for Jesus that wasn't God inside minded first. It's so good to be with you. Thank you for this time. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed defining a Christian. By all means, it's not complete. But we're gonna jump back into some other things quickly and I know you're gonna really enjoy it. Join us every Tuesday, every Friday, on Adventures in Grace. Go to jhmi at jimhockaday.com and send us your grace stories. Oh, by the way, super cool. One of the guys there uh, at this last church came up to me and said, for five to six years, uh, things just haven't been right in my bathroom habits. I've gone five, six, seven times a day and things were really loose. I'm not gonna go any further than that. You laid hands on me the very next moment, morning. Everything was normal. Come on, somebody receive that right now, that that testimony has within it the power to set you free as well. We'll see you next time.